This is Lelo and Pal. <laughs> right? Somebody said I should have unplugged myself from the kitchen table a long time ago. <laughs> but I didn't. You know, the, I'm going into what I call right time, which means I'm going to work part time, but I'm going to write stories. Because think about this. Read all of your history books. Read, look at television. Look at the movies. How often do we appear? People that look like us. Even people that look like you, Jorge. You don't need many of those, but um, <laughs> one's enough. But we need Latinos showing up. We need our stories to be told before we had an oral tradition. Uh, Centro de la Raza is trying to capture its history. That's very important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write stories about people that I've met in the Chicano movement. I'm doing one book tour uh, that starts in November, all of November. I'm going to go throughout the Southwest. I'm going to be meeting with gangs that I met with, other activists, uh, with uh, Richard Montoya of Culture Clash in LA, trying to develop some scripts and stories about Latinos and Chicano stories that need to be told because we're not in the books. And if you go to Texas, they're taking us out of the books. They're taking African Americans, and they're taking gays and lesbians out of the history, the textbooks that are going to be taught in the schools. So we, as Latinos, are like David against Goliath. Remember you read that story in some biblical text? So I started reading it because I wanted you know, to know when the odds are a thousand to one against you, how do you stand up? You need six rocks, 12 rocks, uh, wind or electronic or sh slingshot. What do you need to topple the giant? The more I read about the story, I said, you know what? The people that were writing the holy books were men. What if it had been women? It would have probably been Diana versus Goliath, right? Why are all the heroes in the Bible men? Right? Pretty much. So it could have been Diana against Goliath. So I say Diana versus Goliath. If a woman or a man could stand up against incredible odds, and people do it every day. They do it on immigration. They do it as parents. They do it as students. When you have to stand up against racism in the school, against people who try to isolate you for whatever reason, there are people that are carrying that struggle on every day. They have to tell their stories. It's part of my job and your job and to stand with them. And also to be able to have fun in the process. Because, you know, for our energy, we're in a struggle. But we've got to have fun as a part of the process. The other day I had, uh, you know how you want to, they say, you know, there's a lot of therapies that you can go to. You know, the people say I should be in therapy every day. Well, I went to my a public therapy session. David Ayala of One America and I debated two people, two representatives from Arizona on SB 1070, the anti-immigrant bill. Uh, they were the head of the, uh, the Law Enforcement Association and the head of Latino Republicans. That was the best therapy for me. <laughs> to, you know, to talk about SB 1070. Because all the time they've been telling lies about immigrants and about why they needed this bill, and they can't prove it. I'll just tell you a couple. Krenz, the farmer that was killed, there's really no proof that he was killed by an immigrant. Afterwards, there was another officer, the day the bill passed, that uh, he was shot by immigrants. There's no proof, and I brought it out to them. I said, show me the proof. Any police evidence that that was the truth. Um, the Governor Jan Brewer went around saying that immigrants were bringing across drugs regularly, that the majority of the drugs being brought were by immigrants crossing the desert. No proof. DEA, Department of Drug Enforcement, could not show that. Then she said there was headless bodies. They went to all the morgues, there were no headless bodies. But what this does is it causes a fear. A fear that reaches into, uh, into Seattle, into Washington, where people worry about immigrants, they worry about the problems and uh, 
and then they start even here trying to pass anti-immigrant bills and, and pushing this. You know, one of the things we have to do is we, we have a lot of responsibility because probably the best and the brightest never got to school. That's what I say. My barrio, the best and the brightest are in prison or they died in Vietnam or they're on drugs or some other issue. Paul Fernandez, who was about this tall, good-looking, Latino, well-read, he said, I'll do all your senior papers, write them for you. If every time I get in a fight, you'll join me. So, man, I was beating up my best friend. They said, why are you hitting me? I said, it's for my civics paper. <laughs> I wanted to wrestle. So Paul got me out of that uh, high school. But I have to tell you, you know, I, I use a lot of credit because I work with Cesar Chavez. So I said Chavez was cheap, man. He paid us five bucks a week. Get serious. But we did it because we loved the community. We loved our people. Last time I saw Cesar alive in 1992, we were walking together outside a Safeway. And I worked for him in 1970. So this is 23 years later. Cesar says, why don't you come back and work for us? And I go, why would I want to do that? He says, we've doubled the wages. I go, ooh, $10. <laughs> And then he had the audacity to die, right? Who gave Cesar Chavez the right to die in 1973? So then, or 1993. So then his family and the union leadership, they came and said, Magdaleno, um, uh, we want you to come help start the Cesar Chavez Foundation. And I said, you know, because money's a big deal. I said, well, what's the wages? They said $10 a week. And I went back, and for two years I worked for $10 a week. And the reason I did that is because the farm workers taught me about what I needed to do for my community. It's not only Cesar, but Malcolm X who talked to me through his writings, through his talks about why I should not use drugs or pimp my own neighborhood. Big change in my life. One other story I have to tell you about, because you know, I get a lot of kudos and credits because I was a farm worker, you know, and in my day, I thought I was with the best, you know. We had the asa, asadoncito, the, the chiquito, you know, where we worked like that. Um, so, and I started working when I was 11 years old, and I gotta tell you, I'm one of the laziest Mexicans. We have some real hardworking Latinos, but I'm not one of them. <laughs> I've never been. Uh, and I wasn't as a farm worker, but when I was 17, graduated from high school and working next to my father with topping onions, if you've ever done the Savoia, and it's hard work. And, and then I was about half this size. I wasn't like you called me round Leno. <laughs> I think he said his Leno around and I took it wrong. <laughs> and um, so you know, it was about half this size and, and there were some good looking farm worker girls there. I had my headband on, I was sweaty. Those days I had muscle, so I had my shirt off. You know, so I was doing the pose, the Madonna take a pose. You know, with my asadon and, and the women were looking. And my father, who was a man of few words, said, uh, Magdaleno, um, did you ever think about doing something other than farm work? I said, no. He says, well, did you ever think of going to college or a trade school or something like that? I said, no. I said, uh, never thought about that. And I said, Dad, uh, do you think I could do that? He says, well, I'm not sure about that. But the one thing I'm sure about is you're not a very good farm worker. <laughs> and if you stay in this business, you're going to starve. And your family's going to starve. So you better find a different way of life. Because I was a dreamer. Even then, I was a big joke in the fields, because I would watch the jets go over. They said, what are you going to do? Why are you looking at the jet? I said, one day I'm going to fly in a jet. You know, in 19... Uh, 55, 56, when you said you're gonna fly in a jet and you're a farm worker, it was like the furthest reach. I said, I'm gonna go around the world, I'm gonna have an office job, a secretary, and they said, you can't even read and write. How are you gonna do that? But that's because people interviewed. And that's what the Latino Community Fund is all about, intervening in people's lives and standing up. And we were told today why we have to stand up for this education bill, why we have to stand up for issues. Because we can make a difference because the best and the brightest are yet to come from our community. And they're out there. They're artists, they're painters, they're mechanics, they're draftsmen, they're carpenters. 
There's all kinds of people that are out there that we have to give a chance. And you know, every day we're being attacked. And I have to tell you that it bothers me the number of hate crimes against immigrants, the number of hate crimes against Muslims, the number of hate crimes against gays and lesbians. I'm tired of it. And they use this hysteria to be able to keep us all out of participating in what is supposed to be called the greatest democracy in this world. And as Fannie Lou Hamer said so many years ago, who was a civil rights activist in the South, she said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. So for those of us here, it's a call for us to do something more. You know, every day when I wake up, not all of us are going to become Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Martin Luther King, uh, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, the heroic figures that we all have in our life, uh, Harvey Milk, who's one of my heroes. Um, but we do can make a change, and we can stand up. You know, and it begins like South Park. Y'all got noisy and nasty and ugly, but you got money for the bridge. And that's what it takes. Them standing up and us supporting them. And that's what the Latino community fund is. We know you saw the statistic. It's a crime that for all the foundations that are out there, only 1.3% of the funds come to Latino groups, to minority groups, to people of color. They've forgotten us. And we can't forget ourselves. So we have to participate. You know, I, I normally close my talks with the words of one of my heroes, who was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, would tell us it really doesn't matter how long you lived, but what you did when you were alive. It really doesn't matter how powerful your friends were, how much money you accumulated, if you did not use that to help somebody else. So it really doesn't matter how long you lived. You know, we all want to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But what did you, what were you able to do while you were alive? And you know, it's not the promise. We're always making promises that we don't keep, right? I'll love you forever. You know, let's have lunch. I'll, I'll come visit you in this far off place called Yakima. Uh, it's another world over there. Looks just like where I came from, Las Animas Colorado. Yeah. But we make promises that we don't keep. So we might wonder about the promises that we should keep. And if we keep one promise, it's to our community, to Latinos and Latinas, that we want to make a difference. And some of you are already doing that. And right now, Rebecca and I are going to ask you, those of you who have not made a promise to the Latino Community Fund, to join with us in the promise that we've been making to our community, the Latinos and Latinas who are out there. Rebecca.